Welcome back to the Basic Essentials of Christianity. Um, for this section, uh, for this session, we're going to do a two-in-one discussion again, where we talk about two related but still different topics within Christianity, and see how we can best understand both of them in a short amount of time. So. With that, let's get started. First, we want to talk about the doctrine of creation in the beginning. So looking at creation from a Christian perspective, what is creation? And what does creation include? We often talk about creation in very vague, generalized terms which is appropriate because creation is a very vast topic, idea, concept. But what is creation? And what does it include? What do we mean by creation? Well, quite literally, I think creation is everything. Everything that exists, everything that is, is creation. A good account of creation and what it includes we find in Genesis chapter 1, where it talks about um, on the different days how God was creating creation. And the major points that it highlights, the major pieces of creation that it highlights are light, sky, heaven, and seas, oceans, the earth and planets, sun, moon, stars, fish and birds, animals and humans. That pretty much covers everything as far as creation goes. And so creation is everything that we see, everything that is existing both on Earth and outside of Earth, in the galaxy, in the universe, in all of creation. Everything is creation. Before we move on, notice something very interesting about the six days. Do you notice a correlation there? Do you notice a connection with some of the days with each other? This was pointed out to me by uh, the video Rob Bell's Everything is Spiritual. And I think this is absolutely fascinating. If you'll notice, day one and day four go together. Day two and day five go together. Day three and day six go together. Light and darkness with the sun, moon, and stars. The sky and the seas with the birds and the fish. And the earth and the planets no, I'm sorry, the earth and the plants with humans and the animals. The way that this is explained is that the Hebrew authors of Genesis 1 were talking about how the first three days was God putting form to the formless. How God was taking the chaos and the formless void that was creation and existence. And in the first three days, God put form and order and structure to it. And then the second set of three days, days four, five, and six, was God filling what was empty. God taking that form and that structure and filling it with beauty, with creation, and with life. And each of those days kind of go together. And so the sun, moon, and stars are the filling to the light and the darkness. The birds and the fish are the filling to the sky and the seas, and the animals and the humans are filling the earth. And I think this brings up a really important idea, is that God created all of creation to be connected to each other. That all of creation is to be in relationship with all other pieces of creation. None of us are disconnected from the other. Each piece of creation is connected to and is in relationship with all the other pieces. 
So I just think that's really interesting, and I think it's something we need to consider when we talk about creation. So now moving on to look at the core of creation doctrine. What is the kind of bedrock belief about creation doctrine? The first point is that God is the creator. Right off the bat, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created. This is a theological statement by the authors of Genesis. That at the very beginning of time, before anything and everything, it was God who created. We also affirm this within the creeds of the Christian church, the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed. The very first line in both of them is, We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We affirm that God is the creator of all creation and of all life. God is creator. Point number two, that all creation is good. We find this after almost every single day in the creation account of Genesis 1, where God will say, God will speak something into existence, and it will come and it will form or fill and do its thing. Scripture says that God saw that it was good. And then at the very end, when everything is created, all of creation, God looks and it says that indeed it was very good, that all of creation is very good. We need to affirm and recognize that all of creation is good. All animals, all plants, all people are created by God and therefore are good. They have an intrinsic, natural, in and of themselves, not based on what they do, but just based on what creation is, is good. So that's point number two. And point number three is that creation is a free and loving gift. Part of this comes out of the idea of, in you looking at the context of uh, how and when Genesis was written, a lot of times in the ancient Near East, creation came about because gods or deities were warring with one another, were fighting with one another. There was some sort of a conflict, and then creation came out of that. And so the Hebrew authors want to say that instead of conflict bringing about creation, that creation was brought about by a god who wanted to fill it in a positive, a good way. That creation is not something that erupts out of violence or uh, struggle over power, but that creation was created, was made, out of love. And another point to think about this is that we have to remember that God is perfectly sustaining and that God does not need creation. God is not dependent upon creation. God is, you know, as the Trinity, perfectly alive, loving, perfect being as God's self. God does not need creation. However, we would say that the creation was the overflow of love from the Trinity. A couple people within the various denominations talk about how there was so much love, so much goodness within the Trinity that it just kind of spilled over, that it just overflowed into creation, that God was so loving in and of God's self that God said, I want to share this, I want to spread this around, not because I need it, but because I want it. We have to always affirm that creation is a free and loving gift from God. Um, sometimes we get the misconception that God created humanity and creation because God wanted something to control and something to kind of manipulate and have little beings that would do God's bidding or worship God. Um, but I think that's a very poor caricature of the story of Genesis. God was not power hungry, and God was not seeking minions 
or you know this divine display of power when God created. God created for the sake of love. And so if this is the core of the Christian doctrine of creation, we have to also recognize that there are different models of how this core uh, reflects and looks. And so that would be the, the three core pieces we would consider the essential pieces. And the models are now kind of leaning more towards into the non-essentials, the details, the specifics behind it. And there are three models of Christian creation that are the most prominent, most talked about, uh, discussed, written about models of creation. There's young earth creationists, old earth creationists, sometimes called progressive creationists, and then evolutionary creationists, or what's called theistic evolutionists. Theistic just means that it's based on God. So those are three models, the three biggest, the three most talked about basic models of Christian creation. There are other forms such as intelligent design and a couple others, but for the sake of our discussion, these are the three that I'm going to be focusing on. So the first is young earth creationists. And this is a very simplified, basic understanding of what it is that young earth creationists hold to and believe. Their view of creation is that God created the earth and all the inhabitants recently, and that Noah's flood explains the geologic record. Geologic record being the fossils, rocks, data that we get from carbon dating and all of that. Their view of the creator is that the God of the Bible is the creator. Their Genesis interpretation idea is that Genesis is literally accurate in all historical and scientific details. Uh, when talking about the age of the Earth, they say that the Earth and the universe are young, probably no more than 10,000 years old, which some people might be shocked and say, that's young, and just wait. With regard to Noah's Flood, young Earth creationists would say that Noah's Flood was a global and Earth-changing catastrophic event. Most of the fossils, sedimentary rocks, mountain ranges, canyons, etc. can be attributed to the effects or after-effects of Noah's Flood. And then science as extra-biblical evidence, they would say that the Bible is the truth in all areas. Science is secondary. When science doesn't appear to agree with the Bible then scientists are wrong. Science can only reinforce God's revelation. And so the Bible is the primary, absolute, definitive authority on all matters of truth. And though science can be used for evidence and can be a secondary source, if there's a conflict between science and the Bible, then the Bible trumps. The Bible wins. So that's young earth creationist. Progressive creationists. Their view of creation is that God used natural processes under his ordinary providential control and guidance to create earth. And also that God intervened directly and supernaturally at various strategic points in biological history. And so God used process, uh, God used natural processes to help the creation of earth along but there were also specific points where God intervened and supernaturally, miraculously um, came into biological history. Their view of the Creator is that the God of the Bible is the Creator. Their interpretation of Genesis is that Genesis can be harmonized with scientific discoveries about the creation. The age of the earth, the earth is old probably as much as 4.65 billion years old. The universe is even older, probably around 13 billion years old. And so that's why I say, if you think 10,000 years is young, that's why. With regard to Noah's Flood, Noah's Flood was a local event. There was no, if, there's no evidence for a global catastrophic flood. 
And then science as extra biblical evidence. Science adds significantly to our understanding of God and the scriptures. A true understanding of science and the Bible will be in harmony, each reinforcing the other. Biology is out of harmony. And so, if the truest understanding of creation for progressive creationists is that science and the Bible will agree with one another and they will reinforce and be in harmony with one another. But presently, biology and science are not totally cooperative with scripture. So that's progressive creationists. Evolutionary creationists, their view of creation is that God used natural processes to create the earth and that God also used natural processes like evolution to accomplish biological history. So God uses natural processes to help create, form, sustain the earth. Their view of the creator is that the God of the Bible is the creator. The, their Genesis interpretation would be that Genesis was not written for the purpose of sharing scientific details about the creation. They don't look at Genesis as a science book. Um, they look at it as a piece of scripture. The age of the earth, same as the progressive creationists. The earth is old probably as much as 4.6 billion years old. The universe is even older at about 13 billion years old. Um, again, with Noah's flood, same as progressive creationists, that Noah's flood was a local event, there is no evidence for a global catastrophic flood. And then science is extra-biblical evidence. Science adds significantly to our understanding of God and the scriptures. There is no real disagreement between science and scriptures since the Bible does not address science issues except with respect to ethics. And so their understanding is that there isn't a disagreement with scripture and science because science talks about science and the Bible talks about faith. There isn't really much overlap other than science can give an understanding to the how of God's creation. They still hold the Bible in high regard, but they don't look to the Bible for scientific answers because that's what science is for. So given all three of those models of Christian creation, what is it that all three have in common? What do all three views have in common with one another? The answer is simply that God is the creator and sustainer of all creation. Each one of them, all three models, hold to the idea that God is the creator of all creation. Whether it's instantaneous or over a long period of time, whether it's in six days or 13 billion years, God is the creator and sustainer of all creation. From this, we derive the other two points that creation is good and that creation as a gift come automatically. Because God is the creator and sustainer of all creation, creation automatically is both good and a gift. Sometimes we throw one side, one model, one perspective of creation under the bus by saying, well, they don't hold to this, or they don't believe um, in God as this. In looking at various models of creation and different uh, denominations and traditions within Christianity, every single one of them holds to the fact that God is the primary and the ultimate creator and sustainer of everything. And as long as we have that, as long as we believe that God is the creator of all life, then any of those views would be deemed Christian, orthodox, and okay to believe in as long as we hold God as the creator and sustainer of all creation. And so we come to this crossroads of faith and science. 
So we come to this meeting of science and faith, and we have to ask ourselves, are they friends or are they foes? Are they working with each other and are they cooperating? Or are they enemies that hate each other and work against each other and don't have anything in common? It is my hope and it is my prayer that faith and science would become more friends and would reassure and reinforce one another more than become bitter enemies and only engage in destructive arguments. Before moving on, two more thoughts. One, coming from 2 Corinthians 5.19, we read about uh, Paul writing about how in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Now, to reconcile something means to bring it back together. That somehow it's been torn apart, ripped apart, it has separated. It should be together. And it was originally together, but now it's, it's apart. And so to reconcile is to take those two things and bring them back together. And what Paul talks about is that God is working in Christ to bring all of creation back into relationship with God. And I think this is really amazing because it doesn't just say humanity. It doesn't just say people. It says that in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. God is working in Christ to reconcile all of creation and to bring all of creation back into relationship, back into harmony with God. And this leads into another thought where we read about in Scripture the redemption of all creation. Sometimes we forget about the end of the story. When we look at the last book, the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 21, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Not because the old earth has been, you know, destroyed, blown up, and the new earth is made. There's been this caricature of Christianity in the past hundred years about how the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and those who believe in God simply need to just get out now. Get out of jail, free card, and go to heaven. But we read throughout scripture that God is working to redeem all of creation. That God is working not to destroy the world, but to redeem it and renew it. And make it this new earth. The earth that it should have been and was in the beginning. And to bring heaven and earth back together again. We find this also in Paul's writings in Romans chapter 8, where it talks about how creation is groaning in child pains, in child labor, in the Spirit, to bring about this redemption of all creation. Again, not just people, but creation itself. And we'll talk a lot more about this in our very last session. But I think it's important to remember with regard to creation that God cares about all of creation. And God does not want to simply write it off, blow it up, and start over again. Which connects to the Noah story of how God, rather than wiping out everything and destroying the earth, decides to redeem and renew it. I think God is still working towards that of redeeming and renewing all of creation. So with that, we now move on to our part two, where we talk about humanity. The kind of fancy terminology for this would be theological anthropology. How the study of humans and the study of people is connected to Christianity and to our thinking about God. 
So an odd question, but what is humanity? What are humans? Naturally, we want to think that, well, humanity is us. Humanity is people. And that's right. But I think well, we need to look at this a little bit deeper and try to understand, well, who are humans and what are they? And one of the best places to start with this is Genesis chapter 2. The second alternative creation story within Genesis. Because remember, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are not the same creation story. They are compatible and they work together, but they're different creation stories. And so if we go to Genesis 2, it shows how God is in the garden creating, making. And then God decides to make a person. And so he gathers dust together, forms a body, forms a person, and breathes into it. And so the dust or the ground becomes a person. And what's interesting is that if you look at the, the Hebrew, it says that it was Adema, which is ground or dirt, became Adam, which literally means dusty creature. It's a, a creature, a thing formed from the dust. But also, at this point in time, it was referring to mankind, to humanity, to a human. Not necessarily Adam as, you know, the name Adam we would think about, or to a specific man, but just to humanity, mankind. And then later on, we find that Adam was not meant to live alone. This human, or humanity, is not meant to be by itself. And so God creates Eve from Adam. And then we have the distinction between man and woman. But both are still kind of connected together in this mankind-human idea. And we have to remember that Eve was created as a partner and as a helper to Adam. That Eve was created with equal standing. And it didn't say that God created Eve as a minion, as a sidekick, as a lower subhuman. But it says in scripture, it says that God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Eve was created with a rib from the side of Adam. And a lot of scholars would say that the reason it's a rib from the side is the idea of equal partnership, of side-by-side -side partnership. Not one over the other, not one as the boss of the other, but both with equal standing in creation. Something else to remember with humanity is that humans are created by God. And I know that this might come off as an obvious duh, but we have to remember, all of humanity are created, are creations, by God. By that, we are not divine beings. Humans are finite, mortal, limited beings. Now, it may not have started off that way, but that's how we are now. Humans are not infinite, immortal, and limitless like God. Rather, we are part of creation, and a part of creation means that we have finite um, understanding, mortality, and that we will die, and we are limited in many of our capacities. And also, as a creation, we were created to be in relationship, both with God and with others. If we look again at the two chapters of Genesis, it talks about how God made people so that there could be life, so that there could be relationship, so that there could be love. And then God made Eve and Adam so that they could have each other. And so we were created in part to be in relationship both with God and with other people. 
And this is part of what it means that we are part of the free, loving gift of creation. That all of creation is to be in relationship with itself, as we said earlier, but also in relationship with God. We are all, as humans, part of that creation. And we need to be in relationship with the Creator and the rest of creation. And yet, we would also say that there is something special about humans. That even though we too are a part of creation, and that we are in relationship with one another, with all of creation, there's something special. There's something different about humans than the rest of creation. And this gets us into the conversation about the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei is um, what's called the image of God or the likeness of God. That somehow there is an image or a likeness of God within all humans. Not just some humans, not just Christians, not just mature people, but all humans bear the image or the likeness of God. And we find this in Genesis 1, where God says, let us make humanity in our image. But what is that image? What is that likeness? Over the 2,000 years of Christian thought, there have been many, many ideas. Some have thought that it's our ability to reason or to be rational. Some have thought that humans have a special, unique ability in that their will or their choice, that they can make decisions in special kind of ways. Others have thought that the image of God is creativity, in that we bear the creative mark of God because God is the creator, and therefore we too are creative and try to emulate God in that way. Still others would regard the image of God as the capacity for relationships. And because God is the perfect triune relationship, part of what the image likeness for us is that we too have capacity and longing for relationships. And then finally, it could be that humans are able to both give and receive love from one another, from God and from others that we have the ability to both give and receive love. Um, all of these ideas have merit, and all of them have limitations. Some of them might be better than others, but none of them truly, fully pinpoint what the image of God is. For another look at the image of God, I want to turn to this recent development called the Bible Project. Uh, that has been exploring the Bible, both its books and its themes, and trying to give a helpful, simple understanding to books and themes throughout the Bible. And one of their most recent videos talks about the image of God, the Imago Dei, and I think it's really spot on in a lot of regard. So, have a look. <laughs> So if you lived in ancient Bible times, odds are you lived under the authority of a king. And many of these kings claimed that they were oh. gods, and they would even call themselves the image of God. Meaning they had authority to tell people what to do, order things to be made. Yeah, they got to define good and evil. And these kings would often make statues of themselves, which in Hebrew were called tselem, often translated as idol or image. But for Israel, they didn't view their kings as the God. In fact, they were never supposed to even make images of God. It's exactly right, and that was really unique for that time and culture. This is rooted, first of all, in Israel's belief that you can't reduce the creator God down to any one thing in creation. But there's another reason. People aren't to make images of God because God has already made images of himself. When did he do that? Well, let's go to page one of the Bible. And the first person we meet there is God. He's the one with authority over all creation. He speaks and creation obeys. And he defines what is good and not good. In other words, he alone is king. 
But then surprisingly, as the pinnacle of all of God's creative work, he makes humans, and he calls all of them the image of God. So he gives all humans the authority to rule. Exactly. That's what he goes on to say. He tells the humans to subdue the earth and to rule it. And so this task that once belonged only to elite kings is here in the Bible the task of every human being. This was a revolutionary statement in its day because all humans are being called to rule and to participate in the human project. So what does this mean? I mean, how are we all supposed to rule? So the picture we get in Genesis is gardening. Gardening? Yes. Gardening. So they rule the earth by cultivating it, by harnessing all of the earth's raw potential and then making something more and new out of it. So growing food for each other. Yes, but that also includes growing families then, which become neighborhoods. And then they create communities where people are going to work and take care of each other and build businesses and cities that will expand to new places and so on. So ruling is really the day-to-day acts of our work and creativity. Yes, we take the world somewhere. This is humanity's divine and sacred task. Yeah, and this all sounds really nice. And humans have designed some pretty great things. But just as often we create things that cause a lot of suffering and a lot of injustice, so maybe we shouldn't actually be ruling. Yeah, so the Bible addresses this. In Genesis, what happens is that God gives humans a choice about how they're going to rule. So are they going to use their authority for the benefit of others, which is God's definition of good, or are they going to turn away and define good and evil for themselves and use their authority for self-advantage? And in the story, they choose to define good and evil on their own terms. And so this is the Bible's depiction of the human condition. So sometimes we pull off amazingly good stuff, but just as often, despite our best intentions, we act selfishly and we create evil in the world. And so we're stuck as mediocre rulers making a mess of things. But that's not the end of the story. So the Bible goes on and it makes this claim that all of this was resolved when God bound himself to humanity through Jesus. And he showed us what it looks like to truly rule as a human. So what does it look like? Well, Jesus ruled by serving and by seeking the best for others, by putting himself underneath them and loving not just his friends, but also his enemies. And that's not a typical way to rule. And not only that, Jesus confronted the consequences of all of the evil and the death that we have created by our messed up ways of ruling. And he takes it. I mean, he lets it kill him. And so when the New Testament writers looked back to Jesus' resurrection, they see a whole new future opening up for all humanity. Jesus is a new way to be human. Yeah, that's why they called Jesus the image of God or the new human. And not only that, they also believe that Jesus' divine life and power is now available to heal and to transform us to become our life and power. And this sounds really nice, but what does it really look like? So practically, the Apostle Paul said it looks like people being filled by Jesus' own presence and spirit, filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and integrity and gentleness and self-control. He says this is the new humanity that God wants to create in us so that we become people in whom God's image is being restored, people who will move the human project forward. And that's actually how the story of the Bible ends. It's a renewed world where God is on his throne and his servants are all around him, but they're the ones ruling over this new world, taking it into new uncharted territory with Jesus as their healer and their guide. So with that, and they kind of touched upon it a little bit, let's talk about the role of humanity in creation. What is the role that people play in creation? Um, And a lot of this is going to be referenced from the video you just watched, but a lot of this is actually based out of a book called After You Believe by N.T. Wright, where he talks about Christian living and ethics and all of that. And he would say that there is a twofold nature to the role of humanity in creation, that we are both rulers or stewards and priests. So looking first at the ruler steward, again, we get this from Genesis 1 and 2, where God charges humanity with taking care of the earth. God even charges humans in chapter 1 where it says, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth 
and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That we as stewards and rulers are to fill, subdue, and have dominion over all of creation. But this dominion of creation does not mean that we are in charge as ruler over creation in the sense of we are not the ultimate authority over creation, but rather we are the caretakers of creation. We are the ones who are to have dominion over it in the name of God for the purposes of God. And this is where the idea of a steward comes in. Back in the time of monarchs, rulers, and all of that, if a king, queen, emperor, whoever needed to leave their kingdom to go somewhere, they would have a trusted steward who would sit and rule and govern for them that would take care of their dominion while they were gone. However, they only ruled, they only governed in and under the authority of the person who was actually in charge. They didn't have any power in and of themselves. It was all bestowed upon them by the ruler. And what's more is that they were expected to take good care of the kingdom, of the place under rule, until the actual person in charge came back and said, okay, what have you done with what I've given you? How have we prospered? How have we done well? How have you taken care of my kingdom while I was away? And so that is how we as humans are to be the stewards of creation. God is the one who is actually in control. God is the one who actually has dominion and is the power over creation. But God has entrusted us to be the stewards and the caretakers of creation for the sake of when God comes back to establish the new heaven and the new earth, God will look to us and say, what have you done with my creation? Have you done well or have you done poorly? And so that's what uh, the ruler or steward role is. But also there's the priestly role which we find in 1 Peter 2, where it talks about that we as Christians and as humans are a priesthood. And what do priests do? If you remember from our discussion with Jesus, that a priest, a priest's primary role is worship. That a priest is to lead and conduct worship for the sake of bringing others into worship with God. And so we as priests are to bring glory and honor to God the Creator in all that we do and say to worship God as the Creator. But it's not just us. Again, to be a priest is to lead others into worship. We are not just supposed to worship for ourselves or by ourselves, but we are supposed to lead all of creation in worship as well, and to reflect the praises and glory from creation towards God. And so, here's how N.T. Wright would summarize this concept of priest and ruler. The point of the project, creation, is that the, gra is that the garden be extended colonizing the rest of creation, and human, humanity, is the creature put in charge of that plan. Human is thus a kind of midway creature, reflecting God into the world, rulers, and reflecting the world back to God as priests. And that is the goal for which we are aiming, indeed the goal of all human existence. The royal and priestly vocation of all human beings, it seems, consists in this to stand at the interface between God and his creation, bringing God's wise and generous order to the world as rulers, 
and giving articulate voice to creation's glad and grateful praise to its maker as priests. That is the dual role of humanity. To stand in the midst between creation and God and reflect one back to the other. Now there are other dualistic um, ideas to the nature of humanity. Um, the first is that humans are both a physical and a spiritual thing. Physical being the material spatial form of the person, a.k.a. your body. That humans are physical. But humans are also spiritual. And spiritual meaning the soul or the spirit part of a person. And oftentimes we would say that is the part that makes you, you. That there's something about the soul or the spirit that makes a person who they are. Both are not only necessary for humans to be humans or people, but both are good. The church has had a bad history of downplaying the physical part of the human nature. We really want to emphasize the spiritual part, but we're not so keen to talk about the physical part. And again, this goes back to the idea of the world going to hell in a handbasket. And that, well, the physical, the material world, it's not that good. It's not that great. God only cares about our soul, really, so let's focus on that. And if our bodies or if the physical stuff just kind of gets destroyed, disappears, then oh well. But we have to say that no. God created the body. Therefore, it's good. And that God finds meaning and goodness within our physical stuff, not just our spiritual stuff. We have to recognize that both of these pieces are not just necessary, but are good. And then the other dualistic nature of humanity is that humans are both good and fallen. Again, Humans were created by God and are called good. Humans are intrinsically, in and of themselves, because they are created by God, good. This means all of humanity. And this is a really tough concept to swallow. Every single human being that has ever existed is loved by God whether they're Mother Teresa or Adolf Hitler, whether they've been the best person ever or the worst person ever, every single human is intrinsically somehow good. And we have to remember that, that every person you meet, every single person you see, hear, come into contact with is created by God and is thus good. However, we would also say that humans are deprived and that they are fallen due to sin. One way of thinking of this is that people can't live up to their full potential. Because of the sinful aspect of humanity and in creation, we can't live up to, we can't do what we're supposed to do. And so we would say that humans were created as good, they were created good, and they're not perfect. They can't always do what they need to do or what they should do. And we'll talk about that later when we get into our discussion on sin. But a final point. How we understand humanity must be rooted in the Incarnation. And by that I mean everything we talk about regarding humanity has to be run by the Incarnation. Because if there's something we think that's true about what it is to be a human, what it is to be a person, but it doesn't work with the Incarnation and it doesn't work with Jesus, then I think we've gotten our ideas about humanity wrong. 
because we have to remember that Jesus, as the Incarnation, was fully God and fully human, and was fully human in all ways but sin. Every single aspect of humanity without the sin applies to Jesus. So be very careful in how you talk about humanity, because everything has to be run by the Incarnation and seen if it has any merit or not. So now we come to our discussion questions. Once again, either discuss it with small group or write down some answers. Here's the first set of questions. Where do you see all of creation in relationship with itself? Where do you find creation working together in relationship? Uh, where do you find that? Not just people, but I'm saying creation. Be it animals, plants, ecosystems, environment, whatever. Where do you see creation in relationship with itself? All creation is good. How might that statement, how might that idea affect how we live? If we look at all of creation, every spider, every snake, every tree, every uh, bird, every human as good, how might that affect how we live? And if God is working to reconcile and redeem all of creation, what are you doing to help? What are you doing to help God redeem creation and reconcile all of creation back to him? So take some time to talk about these questions. And then next. How has the church undervalued either the physical or the spiritual side of humanity? We talked a little bit about undervaluing the physical. But some swing the other way and undervalue the spiritual side. And so how has the church, either in a grand universal sense or in a local uh, congregation, undervalued either the physical or the spiritual side of humanity. And then how might viewing all people as good and viewing all people as images of God make you interact with others? If you truly started to work on the idea of every human being seeing them as good, and seeing them as imprinted with the divine image. How might that change how you interact and have relationship with others? And then lastly, how are you living as both steward and as priest? How are you reflecting God into all of creation? And how are you reflecting all of creation back to God? Take some time to answer these questions and let some of them sink with you, sink in a little bit and sit with you for a while. They're important questions. I hope this has been enjoyable and helpful and you've gotten something out of it. If you have any questions, let me know. And otherwise, thanks for joining and I'll see you next time.